Mr. Wright, I've heard you say many f provocative things about the other arts. What have you been reading, or what music have you been listening to? What paintings do you look at? All of them that are available, good and bad, because they're all features of architecture. They're all, all the arts are subject to the mother art, which is architecture. And when architecture was supreme, before it became moribund, they all belonged to architecture and were handmaidens of that great house. And when architecture ceased to be creative, became moribund, all these minor arts, as I call them, painting, sculpture, music even, although music and architecture are greatly parallel, same kind of mind, almost the same technique on a unit system. All those began to take a little shovel full of coals and start out on, them, on their own, you know, to do their own way. And they've never flourished much since. In architecture, of course, we haven't had. And it's all a sort of a pitiful wreck of a great, what was once a great household is now scattered and growing more and more helpless until architecture comes back again. Mr. Wright, women have excelled in such arts as writing and painting and sculpture. Why do you suppose we haven't had women composers or architects. I don't know about women composers. You mean in music? Mm -hmm. And painters? They've been, they've been uh, some good women painters and good women composers. And no architects, because architecture is a pretty tough job. It's uh, comprehensive, and you have to get your hands in the mud of which the bricks are made. And it's a pretty tough performance all down the line. I've always said that it was pretty difficult to be a gentleman and an architect at the same time. <laughs> so I suppose that would be true of a lady, <laughs> only more so. Could we elaborate a little bit on this parallel between music and architecture in, in society? Yes, I've always felt my father taught me he was a preacher, but he was first of all a musician and made his living or tried to, teaching music later on. He never was able to support us by way of it, and his life was a kind of tragedy. But he taught me that a symphony was an edifice of sound, and that it was built. And I learned pretty soon that it was built by the same kind of mind in much the same way that a building is built. And when that came to me, I used to sit and listen to the only master that was immaculate in my, in my listening was Beethoven. He was a great architect, and he had a great disciple, and his greatest disciple was Brahms. Brahms was a true disciple, such as a, any uh, man could be proud to have. If I had in architecture a disciple such as Brahms was, where Beethoven was concerned, I should be extremely happy. And perhaps I will have some day, but the two minds are quite similar because they arrange and build, conceive, develop, plot and plan in very much the same way. And both are working on a unit system, you see. There's the scale, the clef, and all the things that go in the notes on the scale, very like the thing an architect like myself does when he sits down to design a building. It's all on a unit system. You'll see little squares ruled all over the paper. And it all holds, the unit system holds the whole concept together in scale. So that one part isn't coarse and another part fine and, and you'd have great difficulty, but for the practice of the unit system and having a perfect synthesis of proportion. And that ensures the proportion of the thing. So there's a great sympathy between music and architecture. <clears throat> Mr. Wright, your Unity Temple built more than half a century ago. 
is now a landmark in the architecture of the world. What would you say you achieved in it? I think that was about the first time when the interior space became, began to come through as the reality of the building. When you sat in the temple, you were sitting under a big concrete slab that let your eye go out into the clouds on four sides. Then there were no walls with holes in them. You'll notice that features were arranged against that interior space, allowing a sense of it to come to the beholder wherever he happened to be. Mm -hmm. And I'd been working on that thesis for a long time because it was dawning on me then when I built that building, as later in the Hillside Home School, or about the same time, I guess, for my aunts, that the reality of the building did not consist in the walls and in the roof, but in this space within to be lived in. And that was a new countenance that a building should wear. And I was determined at that time to make that the countenance of the building, the interior space within. How about the Roby House of 1909? Why do you think that house so powerfully influenced the design of dwellings everywhere? Well, of course, it's hard to say. Again, the principal was working there, and the house had an atmosphere that belonged to the prairie, and it was more human than most of the things around. The Germans referred to it as dampfer architecture, steamboat architecture. It was an entirely new proportion in building, and it seemed to excite them and interest them abroad even more than at home, although at home they had a great curiosity and they'd come in droves on a Sunday around that house and other houses I was building. They had seen something new, something fresh. Well, then came the beautiful house you call La Miniatura for Alice Millard back in 1923, I believe. It you opened the one in the ravine with some water in it that nobody dreamed could be built on and that was for sale for $3,500 when the lots around were costing five times as much. So we bought it and built the house down in the ravine and that was the first concrete block house, the first Usonian system house. I built five in Los Angeles altogether, but this was the experimental first one. And I couldn't get a permit to build it. I went to headquarters and we had started building and we had been stopped. So I went to the head of the building department, Bacchus, for a permit to build a house. And I took him out to see the house as a preliminary and he looked it over and he said, Mr. Wright, this is the best thing structurally that ever came into this region. Well, then I said, I'm going to get a permit to build a house, am I not? Well, now, he said, Mr. Wright, that's quite another matter. You know, there are the brick men, and there are the lumber interests, and there are all these interests. And if you were to go up for a permit, you'd have, have them all as a contra in a controversy concerning it. Well, then I said, where do I stand? What shall I do? And he thought a minute. He said, go ahead and build it. <laughs> so I built five others. There was a man who didn't think too heavily of, of the laws that had been made contrary to the interests of the human being. There are not very many such. The codes are adamant and at least 15 or 20 years old and entirely contrary to the interest of the man who wants to build a building. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wright, your phrase organic architecture has become a part of the language by now, even if it isn't yet really comprehended. You've often called it a natural architecture, an architecture of integrity. Could you define it further? Well, that word integrity you've just used <clears throat> is what is lacking in almost all art artistic expression or expression of the arts today. And integrity would imply natural would imply nature in a, in a profound sense. 
And when you proceed from generals to particulars, as you do when you are building, that's your natural gut, natural center line of your effort would be the what is the natural thing, what is the nature of your materials, even the nature of your client, the nature of the situation on which the house is built, the nature of the climate. It's all a nature study, the building of a house. And I suppose it would be the same in, in a great composition like Beethoven's Irwaka when he was celebrating the heroism of of uh, Napoleon, and then toward the end of his effort began to feel that Napoleon, after all, was dead so far as his ideal was concerned, and a great sense of tragedy overcame him, and you feel it in the music. It's a great story, a great revelation of a man's worship and disillusionment. As I was going to ask you, about some closer parallels between contemporary music and contemporary culture and contemporary uh, architecture. Well, the difficulty with contemporary music is that architecture is in position, possession of entirely new mediums, <clears throat> entirely new materials, an entirely new way of life, you see. Architecture was compelled to be new if it was going to exist, but no such thing has happened to music. You see, music, the orchestra, is still new, it's modern. All musical instruments that we have today are the same. So the musician has not been gifted, as the architect has been gifted with the means to a new expression. And they have only perhaps a vernacular which they can use to express themselves when they wish to be what they call modern. Now, modern is not necessarily new. Anything built today, no matter what its character or complexion, would be considered modern, but not necessarily new. But if it was new, it would certainly be modern. Mr. Wright, I suppose that Falling Water, built in Pennsylvania in 1936, must by now be the most famous house in the world. What is the nature of that house? Thirty million people must have seen Falling Water by now. Perhaps the whole world has seen it, I guess it has. Mm -hmm. But it was a very simple expression of uh, a man's love for that particular site, the music of the waterfall. And never before had I been given concrete and steel to build a building with. You see, when steel comes into your hand, you can pull on the building and you have what's called a cantilever. Now the cantilever is this principle of tension. Your arm reaching out from your body and held by the sinews and muscles above, and moving as you wish to move it as a cantilever. The trunk, of course, is a support that's in compression. But you can suspend from the end of the cantilever fabrications of any kind. So the new principle in architecture is this principle of the interior support, the extended slab, the arm, and the falling screen hanging to the slab. Now that's the structural synthesis of my own building. And it is essentially organic in itself. And that is falling water in principle. And the grammar of falling water, now we call the grammar of the building, the shapely means you use to, to uh, make the building manifest. That was all a new grammar because it had neither coping nor base course. It was extremely simple, rounded edges above and rounded edges below, and slab surfaces which had characterized the work always. In fact, falling water is no different from the work that preceded it. In general, design and effect, except for the details that go with steel and concrete. You can compare it with several houses that preceded it and see the same thing except for the top edges and the bottom edges. Mr. Wright, what are your 
first considerations in undertaking to design a house? The nature of the site, like falling water. And next, the nature of the materials you have to use and the people you're going to work for and what it is they want to live in. And you have to have an eye on what they want to live for, too. I can't see any future in anything but an individual type of architecture. If the Declaration of Independence in America means anything, and democratic life means anything, that's practically what it means. You see, I was at Tellius in my uh, country home, lying on the bench, the Dutch door half closed below. Great curiosity existed, it was during a tragedy at Taliesin, and people came in droves to look around, and two women ranged up on a Sunday morning, looked all around into the living room, and old and odd, and how uh, beautiful this was, and how that was so interesting, then a pause. Finally, one of them said to the other, well, I wonder if I'd like living in a place like this as much as I'd like living in a regular home. Well, now that's the way it all began. They were, these things were strange. They weren't accustomed. They were accustomed to stuffiness and uh, a messy environment and things never going together, making a kind of commotion. And they didn't understand it and didn't want to understand it. They put it on like some old garment when they built a house without thinking. But now comes the uh, necessity for not just taste, but some knowledge. You have to know now, a little better and a little further along, what constitutes good proportion, harmony in buildings, great and beautiful environment. And it's a culture and a growth in itself of the soul. So the people who live in these advanced houses, I think that's what we can call them, must have a greater feeling for life. They must be more in themselves than the people who haven't arrived at that stage in their development. And once they have arrived there, they are liberated, they feel, and they see so much more than they ever saw before. They see the uh, lineaments of nature, and as Blake would put it, uh, the lineaments of gratified desire. And they write thankful letters, and they're, they're really sometimes very touching. And now, when we don't want to build houses anymore, I can't get out of building them because people write and say, Dear Mr. Wright, ever since I was 16 years old, I have wanted a house designed by you. Now, that's the way it begins, and before it ends, you're building another house, that's all. But that's the way it is now. We're so much uh, engaged in building important things like a new theater, a new type of museum, we call it the Arcaseum, to explain to people that it isn't just another museum. And the uh, Monona Terrace Project in Madison, a civic center, and a great uh, factory and administration building in, in uh, California and a score of other things, you know, that are new and compelling and to do houses at all is a terrible drain because it takes as much to build a house as it would to build a million dollar building almost or at least a half a million dollar building so an architect like myself now is very much like a doctor who will do the things that uh, are essential without profit and charge the profit up to his influential patients. <laughs> so if we get a big building to build now, we can build small buildings. But it's conditioned on that, I guess. Uh, I, I wanted to ask something about the, the other forces in contemporary architecture and, and uh, contemporary furniture and now the people who live in these other Ah, but I didn't that. say new houses. I said organic houses. New 
you see a, a modern young couple in one of these very violently severe modern yeah. places, with, and they, they seem completely at home. They are completely comfortable, this kind of thing. Now, well, they're making a heroic effort. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they are like goldfish, as a rule, in a, in a globe. In these houses that are so classified as they now are, they're not sensible. It's an abuse of privilege and a, an abuse of material. And those things always follow in the line of any new movement. Now, this architectural, desi this desire for an architecture that is more expressive of human culture than the ones we've been having always has its soiled fringe. Every such movement will have its uh, extremists, will have its abusers, will have its exploiters, and that has happened, of course. Now, you can't expect the average man or woman who wants to build a house to know the difference. Something inside them has to tell them what is good and what's bad because they don't yet know. But someday they're going to learn about it in school. And that, I believe, is what's happening now, as we said a little while ago. I believe now people are going to know what constitutes good architecture, good environment, and, of course, good living has to go with it. Good dressing, too. Good conduct, also. All these good things are dependent, more or less, one on the other, and are assisting one another, more or less because you wouldn't dress in a loud and vulgar way in a quiet and beautiful room. Nor would you be so satisfied with tawdry jazz, perhaps, in a room that was beautifully conceived and had a lovely atmosphere and belonged where it was. It would seem more than ever discordant. So these things all match up as you go along and add up to something that we call culture. Isn't that it? That's what culture means. Now, culture and education are two very different things as we practice them. Culture is the developing of the thing by way of itself. And education is informing, teaching, telling, pushing around the individual. So it's only by a natural growth that you can attain culture, but you can come back from a school all filled with, with stuffed with ideas and what we call conditioned instead of enlightened. Isn't that so? So education today doesn't mean culture. In fact, my old master, Louis Sullivan, used to declare that an eyebrow is a man educated far beyond his capacity. I mean a highbrow. <laughs> was a man educated far beyond his capacity. And today I think all these youngsters are educated far beyond their capacity and not cultured at all. So I say that education today is not even on speaking terms of what we should call culture. And we need culture more and education less. How do we get it? We get it by such effort, I think, as this thing we're talking about an organic architecture, a new sense of what constitutes humanity under harmonious conditions. A harmonious place in which to live and a harmonious way to live in it. And it is greatly influential where all these various factors in human living are concerned. There's a tremendous, uh, what do you call it, not kickback, that's not a good word, but uh, reflection. What would you call it, man? I mean, a boomerang? No, no, it doesn't come back that way. It's something that has a continuous pressure and influence on you mm -hmm. toward harmony and the good. The consequence? Well... There is a word, of course, for everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you don't come by it every time. I think all these young people in school now are hungry for something. 
that they don't get or they wouldn't write to me. And I think that also that it's an instinct of the higher nature. You see, you're only human as you rise above the animal. Your animal self is one fundamental factor or element in your life. Then when you come into the higher things that are not animal, the things of the spirit, then you get into this realm that we call art, and you begin to look for things that are creative rather than just uh, repetitive. And I think there's where you're in the realm of culture rather than education, because you can educate an animal. You've seen them do tricks, haven't you? Well, I think that's a pretty good uh, contra uh, definition of the difference between education and culture. So you can see how the trampling of the herd would have a small chance to develop culture of an individual. It's got to be an individual affair. It's got to be a slow f affair. It's got to be a peculiar to you affair. Now, how are you going to do it with 20,000 students in a university? How are you going to do it with high schools crammed two stories, three stories high with a crowd of students? As a matter of fact, culture is not for the herd. Culture is not for the crowd. Culture is an individual thing. And that's what our forefathers struck when they decided, and when they declared, I mean, that, that uh, the individual is sovereign. The sovereignty of the individual. Now, that means a certain premium on aloneness to start with, a certain uh, rejection of the common man as common, but insisting on his privilege to be uncommon. And so that exists in every human soul today. And this is the country that we live in that declares it the only one that has made it official, the only one that has made it constitutional to be yourself. <laughs> and we see abuses of it, of course, all down the line now. We see, it, uh, we see ourselves all drifting back again, drifting toward the commonplace, drifting toward the common man, and you hear it asserted that uh, that was what our country meant, that the common man was free to be common. Well, he wasn't. He was free to become uncommon. And that's the freedom that we ought to tote and talk about. And we should resent with all our strength this drift toward equalitarianism, which is commonness raised to the nth power. And do you think that it's the, the impact of city life which has uh, deteriorated the, the... Oh, of course, the influence of city life. Is, is this why you're in favor of decentralization? Are you against the city as a unit of, of contemporary life, and how would you aid in decentralization in, in the face of the tremendous numbers of people we're dealing with now? But it's because of the tremendous numbers of people and the advantages that those people now have that the city is dated. And the city is now a bad influence on human beings so far as their future is concerned because there are so many of them. And they have now such advantages as they never had before. They have transportation, speed, listening, this, which we're using now. It's no longer essential for people to crowd together anywhere. And there's no reason why you can't have all the advantages of the city to a much greater extent far away from crowds. In fact, crowding is now anathema. Crowding cannot be done. Well, the city, of course, is a, is a thing of the past. There was a time during the Middle Ages when that it was the only source of culture. There was no way of acquiring this thing we call culture except by direct contact, you see.
isn't so now. It hasn't been so for many years. It wasn't even so when this country was founded, but of course it was more so. But gradually, all the, the development of all these sciences, the gifts of science to us, have made this crowding unnecessary. And it always was after the Middle Age, after the Middle Ages, it always was a detriment. It never had any real, uh, never was any real asset to humanity. And especially when the emphasis now comes on the individual and the growth of the individual unit and the whole process of civilization dependent upon the quality of that individual, especially. We've got to give over this uh, crowd. We've got to get out of the crowd. We've got to be all the crowd there is ourselves in proportion as we desire it. Yes. Now, some of us will always want to huddle. Some of us will always want to pig pile. Some of us will let us... That'll, that'll segregate the uh, sheep from the goats, so to speak. You can stay and huddle and pig pile if you want to. But when you feel yourself to be an individual and you feel this declaration of our freedom, when you get that into your system, you'll want to go out somewhere where you can be as alone occasionally and be yourself as you want to be and have the benefit of nature. You see, the city now is a divorce from nature. It didn't used to be such a divorce from nature as it is now, but now it is a great divorce from nature. And there's no substitute. You see, quality, there used to be a big sign on the roadsides. I used to say it. It was advertising a patent medicine, I think. So quality knows no substitute, but nothing truer was ever said. Now, quality cannot come from pig piling and herding and trampling with the herd. Quality is not compatible with quantity. Quantity can never be quality. No matter what the quantity is, there will always be in it the uh, rising within of quality, see. And that is culture, and that is our country. That's what we've declared, that if you'd give this so-called common man a break equal to any other man's break, what was good in him, and the faith of democracy is that, that every man is good if he has a chance to be. He will be. What do you envision as the future of architecture now? The future of architecture is the future of the human race. The two are one. If the humanity has a future, it is architecture as a basic element in its culture. And if it has no future, no architecture. How do you decide on the materials that give your ideas concrete form? Well, those that are native, of course, are best, most appropriate, and the cheapest, most feasible. If there's stone in the neighborhood, we like to use stone. If there are kills and there's brick, and brick is characteristic, well, fire, fire built built houses are good. And old wood is always the friend of man. Don't you feel friendly to a tree when you see one? And if you don't see one, you're hungry for it. Association with trees. Trees and human beings belong together. I don't think one could exist without the other, perhaps. If they could, it would be the tree that would survive. <laughs> well, what about the changing face of a city like New York, which is being torn down in a tremendous ray and being re But it isn't changing, that's the trouble. It's simply repeating and repeating and repeating and piling up on itself. It can't change. It has lost the capacity, the proportion to change. It's like something compressed into a, 
into a tin canister or some metal form or some packaging. It's, it's so pushed in tight it can't change. Well, it seems to me that crowding and pressure of individual upon individual, gracelessly, meaninglessly, is absolutely against the development of the individual as such. So I think the development of the individual is not possible on terms of modern urbanism. You can educate him, and that's where he is, I guess. It may be educational, and it certainly isn't cultural. I guess, as you've said, the danger is in the standardizations that come in the machine age. Absolutely. It's taken me all these years to learn that standardization is no bar to beauty. And the standardization can be controlled and the machine used as a tool to develop a beauty greater and more beneficent, more pervading, more all-embracing than anything we ever knew before. So that's what this age means. That's what the machine age should mean. But it's being exploited and uh, turned inside out, turned over wrong side up by all these opportunists and this desire for material uh, benefits and success. Same old story. There's nothing new in it. It's just as it always has been. It's only when it is conquered and we're, we're aware of this greater and finer way of life that we're truly Americans in the sense that we have a new country and a new ideal, and we have a new, therefore, we're bound to have a new architecture. You said before that science was opposed to beauty or alien to it. Do you think this is a permanent state or...? I think science <coughs> has far outrun our capacity to take its gifts and use them with uh, proper profit to ourselves. I think science has now reached a point where we're on the brink by way of it, and we can destroy ourselves by one false step. Because science gave us things that we weren't yet ready to use. We didn't know how to use them properly. We don't know how to use speed. We don't know how to use uh, so many of the things science has given us yet. And the fact that we're crowding in cities shows it. Proves that we haven't learned anything. That we haven't really profited by what science has done. Science destroyed the city. Science has given us the basis for an organic architecture. It's science now that builds the building that we call organic. But science as a tool, not as a master. Do you plan for painting and sculpture within a house as... Well, certainly. It's an expression of an idea that embraces all of that. The conception of the house as, as an idea is uh, aiming at beauty, concord, comfort, everything that goes into the making of, of the human spirit. Beautiful. We were talking about contemporary art and sculpture and how they fit into your scheme of architecture and your philosophy of contemporary, contemporary art. Yes. Well, that wasn't what I had in mind. I'm searching for a lost thread here. It was concerning uh, human nature in search of something better than the thing it knows. Human nature is always uh, restless, aiming, desiring, and uh, feeling either an uplift or a depression or being shoved aside. Now, architecture gratifies that sense of the future, the uplift, the becoming. And of course, all art should, more or less does. But architecture primarily is the basis of that 
and from it you get your painters and you get your sculptors and you get your crafts people all desiring to make something suitable, fitting, uh, calculated to make human life happier. Gadgetry is intended to make it easier and does. <laughs> but without these other things of the spirit, these mechanical things which we have so many of now and so much of, that has given us a facility we don't know what to do with. All we can do now is to rush from here to there with some idea that we want to go somewhere. We want to go now. But what we get out of going isn't what's so important as it ought to be. So here we are with all this increased facility, speed, and what is speed? Speed is just veracity, isn't it? You're voracious. You go this fast, and go there in five minutes, then you're looking forward to going there in two minutes, and pretty soon in one minute. And it's a kind of veracity that eats you up. And so we have that equivalent in nearly everything. I notice the boys, when they're working in the kitchen, turn on the uh, radio and the television and they'll see television, listen to music while they're washing the dishes and cooking the food and it all comes pouring in, you see, as though it didn't cost anything. Now all that has its consequences. We have to reckon with it. And that's why it's so important that all this should be good. And none of it, almost none of it is. I should say the influence of nine-tenths of it was demoralizing. Not uh, building up, but uh, deadening or, or deforming or something of the kind going on all the while. Is it getting any better? I don't know whether it's getting any better. Yes, it must get better. Things are always either getting better or worse. <laughs> I never stand still. <laughs> now, of course, I see great evidences in, in architecture. While much of it and most of it is imitative and not uh, really creative, still it's better than what we used to have. Still there is an improvement all down the line. There is a raising a standard, I think, in the country. And I believe that we're on the way to a culture of our own. I think we're going to have it. And I don't think I'd be alive here today. I wouldn't have the uh, work I have at my time of life unless that was there. I think that perhaps I today am one of the best proofs you could have of the fact that we're going to have it. Otherwise, they'd have chucked me out long ago. Well, that and the fact that the youth are so... Much interested. Yes and so vitally interested in something that you would, wouldn't imagine they would be. You'd be surprised to learn of it. I was. No, oh, it's there, and it's coming, and it's going to be a mess for some time to come. Nearly everything has been a mess until it qualified. Quantity is always a mess until it qualifies. Now, when quality comes in, and quality is coming, then we're going to be a great democratic nation, which means a nation with a great faith in humanity. That's what democratic should mean, and it doesn't mean that now. But it will eventually, and we'll have the greatest art I think the world has ever seen. We're on the way to it now. We've rejected all of these baser elements of conditioning and deforming and transferring of art to the nervous system, taking it from the region of the soul, we're going to put it back into the region of the soul again. Or it's going to take care of it itself. I don't think we'll do it. It isn't up to us really to do anything except what we believe in ourselves. 
to be ourselves is the great privilege conferred upon us now. Of course, uh, without conscience, we can't belong to a society. If we were without conscience and we had a, the idea of freedom that seems to activate most of these people, we'd land in jail very soon. So conscience and freedom are inalienable companions. One is because of the other, should be. And if it isn't, we're not going to be a success as a nation. And we're not going to have an architecture, we're not going to have anything. We'll crawl. We'll go back to the slime, I guess. Is your first concept of a house usually expressed best in, in one elevation or in several? The plan is the thing. The thing comes to life in the plan because you can't make a plan without a sense of what the plan is for. And I think a plan is always beautiful, perhaps more beautiful than anything that ever comes afterward. The plan, the idea, is the plan. The plan contains the idea. Now, the house is an idea, if it's a good house. And that idea embraces all that composes, or will compose, the uh, usefulness and beauty of that house. It's right there in the plan. Do you often feel that there is a, a wide gulf between that first conception and the house as it's executed? Never. Never. If there is, why well, you, you've torn it away and started again without knowing it. <laughs> and that couldn't happen to an architect because the steps are, are like, they're all interknit and it's like knitting something you're weaving it and bringing it to be by way of actual steps in construction and in the use of materials and in the understanding of human nature which you possess. It's all interwoven. It's all a weaving. And after the weaving is done, there it stays. And you're interested in another weaving. And that stays. But it's always coming out from the everywhere into the here. And the best weaving is still to be.